The following presentation is brought to you by the Realm Network. Today on Mr. Media, I'll talk to Elliot Mintz. He'll probably be best remembered for his enduring connection and ultimate friendship with John Lennon and Yoko Ono, first as a Los Angeles broadcast journalist and later as their press agent. But he'd probably be pleased if you knew that he also conducted hundreds of interviews with other celebrities across several decades. Many of them are now archived in one place, ElliotMintz.com, free to be enjoyed by one and all. Stick around. Mintz was never able to coerce the Beatles into getting back together, but he never stopped trying. So much media, so little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is the Mr. Media Interview, brought to you today by Amazon.com. When you visit MrMedia.com and click on any of the links to purchase books, music, movies, gift certificates, or anything else through our Amazon link, you support this free video podcast. Whenever you need something else from Amazon, please consider returning to MrMedia.com to order it. It doesn't cost you any extra, and we sure appreciate the support. And don't forget, MrMedia.com has more than 1,200 celebrity audio and video interviews archived on the site. That's hundreds upon hundreds of hours free entertainment. Subscribe for free on MrMedia.com, and you'll instantly get an email every time a new interview is posted. You can also watch and subscribe to the show on YouTube, Vimeo, Dailymotion, The Realm Network, and Frequency.com. And if you prefer to just listen, Mr. Media is also available for free on iTunes, Spreaker, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Blueberry, TuneIn, Blog Talk Radio, Podfeed.net, and Player FM. You can subscribe to any of those services and never miss another episode. Finally, you can interact with Mr. Media Interviews on all kinds of social media, including Facebook, Twitter, Google+, and more. Friend or follow us, we'll friend or follow you back. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience full of professional interviewers who would give their left uh, pinky for an archive as diverse and substantial as Elliot Mintz's in the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. I'm going to school today, and you're all invited to sit in on a master class with me. Teaching a course on getting the get and not screwing it up once you have it will be my guest, master celebrity interviewer and media consultant, Elliot Mintz. It's okay if you're asking yourself, who is Elliot Mintz? It just means you're likely from a younger generation, one that didn't come up in the post-Beatles pop culture of the 1970s. Mintz, to the best of my recollection, first came to my attention for his close ties to John Lennon and Yoko Ono throughout the 1970s, and for his continued presence as a media consultant, I believe, for Yoko following Lennon's murder. He first entered their sphere as a TV reporter for KABC Channel 7 in Los Angeles, where a 1971 interview he conducted with Ono went so well and was perceived as unusually fair that Lennon agreed to be his next subject. But while most people who lived through this era will remember Mintz for his Leno Ono connection, he was also quite an accomplished journalist, recording conversations with a who's who of the era, including Jack Nicholson, Allen Ginsberg, Mick Jagger, Salvador Dali, Dennis Hopper, Jane Mansfield, and many, many more. Oh, and then there's this. He was a student at Los Angeles City College on November 22, 1963, when a guy behind him recognized a name and face that they saw on television as someone he knew from the military. Hot damn, the guy said. That's Lee. Lee? Yeah, I served in the Marine Corps with him. No shit. This classmate had been up close and personal with Lee Harvey Oswald while serving in the military. And that interview, and Mintz quickly took his classmate into a recording studio to get it down, was Elliot Mintz's first scoop as a cub reporter. The wild ride was on. But it's Mintz's story. I'll let him tell it. Elliot Mintz, welcome to Mr. Media. Thank you so much, and thank you for that uh, effusive uh, introduction. Greatly appreciated, and I'm humbled by the references. 
You're very welcome. I'm only sorry we don't have a couple hours because I know I've got a lot more questions than I've got prepared here to have time for. So we'll do the best we can. It's early in Los Angeles, yeah. and I'm not sleepy, and there is no place I'm going to. So <laughs> have me as long as you want. All right. Well, okay, so take me back. You're in broadcasting class with a guy who served in the military. This seems incredible, with Lee Harvey Oswald, the Lee Harvey Oswald. So, I mean, you know, you talk about being in the right place at the right time, which is what careers like yours and mine have been made on. Can you tell us about that moment and what was going through your mind as you're, you're watching on TV and you're hearing this guy behind you say something and you're making the connection? I always think of it as being at the right place during the wrong time. I was at the right place because I stood next to this man who had served in the Marines with uh, the uh, suspect in the Kennedy assassination. Uh, we're recording this in 2015 and of course no one um, was ever convicted for murdering President Kennedy and Lee Harvey Oswald never went to trial. But that's for a different program. Um, it was November 22nd, 1963. I had been in Los Angeles about six months. I was attending Los Angeles City College. And um, it happened. And those of us in the little broadcasting uh, cottage all moved towards the monitor. And when that first image of a possible suspect appeared on television, um, the man behind me said, uh, would you just declared hot damn that man's name was Roland Bynum and I had not heard from Roland in 40 years until about a year ago when I posted the story on my website and uh, he emailed me and we had a little bit of a, of a, of a reunion on the phone yeah he uh, he spent time with Oswald when they were in the Marines they had discussions with each other I took that little tape and I made it available to the local news station in Los Angeles. Uh, once it aired on KFWB, which was the all news station here, uh, within a matter of minutes I received a couple of hundred phone calls and by the evening it was on the network news. I think I was um, 21 years old at the time, give or take, and um, yeah. It, it was my first so-called scoop. It, uh, it, it conjures up uh, a, a myriad of memories. One, how unlikely that positioning is under the umbrella of destiny, and how sad that my journey began on a note of the, what some people have referred to as the death of America's innocence. It's, it's, and, and you heard, so tell me about hearing from Roland, because I knew about this from watching on your site. Uh, I, I, hap I happened to catch just the right chunk of interview uh, that Jim Ladd did with you about this. And at that point, when that was done, and I don't know exactly when that was done, but you had said you had given Roland's first name, but you said you weren't really sure if he was comfortable with the connection, so you didn't give his last name at that time. So what did Roland have to say after 40 years? Yeah, after 40 years... Um he saw it on my uh, uh, website and uh, made contact with me. And uh, he, was, he is actually, as we speak, uh, doing a radio show of his own in Los Angeles. He was one of this, the 30 or 40 students from Los Angeles City College uh, who went on and had a broadcasting career of his own. Charming guy, sweet guy. Um, no, he does not mind his last name being used. Obviously, he, uh, he had no particular affection or appreciation for us. Well, the one thing that, that comes out of that interview, and for those people who choose to visit my website, they'll hear Roland describing the interaction. I think in my kind of squeaky uh, 19 or 20-year-old voice, I said something like, um, well, what, did you ever talk politics or anything with him? And I had a New York accent and, you know, on a Wallensack tape recorder. He said um, one of the things that he found interesting is that he had heard that Oswald had been released from the Marines on a hardship discharge. Um, and he left to see his mother. And then it was a matter of months later that he read in the newspaper 
that the same man turned up in Russia, married a Russian woman, uh, had a wedding, had an apartment, and he always just wondered how a man who left in a hardship discharge would wind up with the ability to buy tickets, etc., and begin a new life. That was Roland's speculation in 1963. It stayed with him, and it has stayed with me. And did, uh, is there anything you would have done differently as you look back? I mean, you must have thought about that day a lot. Uh, was there anything that, I mean, inexperience, I mean, we're all inexperienced. The first, the first big interview of my career was Frank Zappa, uh, sitting at the uh, Key Biscayne, Royal Key Biscayne Hotel, and uh, I didn't. I, I the big lesson for me was come prepared next time, son. Come prepared. <laughs> um, but I mean, was there stuff that as you're sitting there with Roland and, and you're you're interviewing him, and you think back on it, were there questions you wish you would ask? Do you wish that you had had time to prepare? Obviously, it just all happened. Yeah, I mean, the nation was traumatized. Um, <sighs> It's very difficult to explain to a generation raised in the wake of 9-11 that was there November 22, 1963. And the impact of um, of the President of the United States being assassinated in public in the afternoon on the streets of Dallas, Texas, uh, was as uh, riveting and numbing and shocking to a nation as those who would watch those towers fall. So I wasn't thinking all that clearly. In retrospect, and I listened to the interview, the interview was in a box that uh, I unearthed for the website for almost 30 years. I had not heard it. And when I listened to to it again, um, no. On that one, there was nothing that I could have changed. I think I was able to mine from him uh, the the recollections that he had without embellishing them. And I felt it was important to get that on the air quickly. This would be the first time uh, the American people would get some insight into who this suspect may have been. There was no time for reflection. Parenthetically, um, on the first radio station I worked for, Frank Zappa was one of my in-studio guests. And in preparation for the interview, I went to an early freakout to, ex- <laughs> to observe the phenomena. And uh, then, of course, read all of his liner notes to that first album. He was one of the most articulate people uh, that I had uh, ever uh, spoken with. He was, he was, my experience with him was that he was super kind. He was very oh. gentle. And I came to him with a list of questions that based on, uh, we would now call them urban legends, urban yep. myths. Yeah, uh, the the guys in the dormitory next to me were like, "Oh, we know all about Frank. We'll tell you what to ask." And if, after the the third question, he said, "Okay, why don't you put those questions down and just talk to me as a human being? Yeah, and just be interested in me." And and he was so kind, and I, it was just a, a, a great. And I it, that interview was posted on Mr. Media as my my first student interview, and it's terrible. And I tell people right up front, it's awful. But if you're a Frank Zappa fan, you might want to hear it anyway. Um, I'm going to listen to it. Oh, no, you don't want to do that. <laughs> you really don't want to do that. He lived uh, five miles from where I'm currently sitting uh, uh, right now in Los Angeles and Beverly Hills. And um, I have since met and spoken with Gail Zappa, his um, widow, and uh, Moon Unit, uh, Zappa, his daughter. Um, he would later go on to testify in front of Congress. He was very active in the business of not having warning censorship stickers on records. Um, among all the rockers I met in, in uh, the field, uh, Frank Zappa really excels. Uh, I, I miss him. I always wish that I had a do-over of that uh, moment, but uh, I would have never had, and certainly uh, before he passed, I, I'd never had the, would have had the, the, the guts or the chutzpah to, uh, to go and ask for one. Um, can, I, can I tell you something just from personal experience, and I don't have to tell you, you're a master at what you do, and um, I, I've listened to a number of your interviews. I'm honored to be on your program. I just recently listened to your Raquel Welch piece. Um, 
In terms of makeovers, do-overs, let's try it again to get it right. I did that with only two or three people who said to me that they just didn't feel that they were on. There was only one interview out of maybe 2,000 that I did that uh, I kind of wished that I had another opportunity because the, the first one that I did with uh, Salvador Dali was an absolute failure. It's, it's posted on my website with considerable embarrassment. And there I am sitting in uh, the living room suite of his hotel in Manhattan. John and Yoko came along for the ride. They were old pals of his. They asked if they could, you know, show up for the day. So a little bit of pressure on me, you know, with uh, that room. Uh, and my interview with Dolly uh, failed uh, miserably. Outside of him, I, I let them all stand. Some are better than others. Some are reflective of where the person was at the moment you spoke with them, where I may have been. Um, but like life in general, uh, this business about erasing the blackboard and trying to reverse a decision you made. Everything we've done in life has brought us to the moment where we are. So uh, I don't mess with the master's plan. Fair enough. Uh, i got to ask you, because I'm sitting in the city where Salvador Dali's museum is based, uh, what was Dali like? I, I, I'm going to go off, off page here, but what was it like to be in a, forget that. What was it like to be in a room with Salvador Dali, John Lennon, and Yoko Ono all at the same time? That's just that's crazy. I find that interviews are best when they go off the page. <laughs> um, well, what was he like? He was highly theatrical. Uh, he's a salesman. Uh, he was self-absorbed. He knew that he may have been at the time if not the greatest living artist, certainly the ultimate artist in the field of surrealism, uh, that he was without comparison, competition. Uh, he rejoiced in it. He was uh, very effusive. Uh, he, he spoke rhapsodically about Alice Cooper, who he liked very, very much, talked about wanting to get into holograms. Uh, John and Yoko had met him uh, a couple of years uh, beforehand. You know, I had spent a lot of time with John and Yoko in the, in the 70s, so being in a room with them was just like being in a room with old friends. But when you, you know, when you're concentrating, as we are now, I'm talking to you, you're talking to me, if, if there were two other people in my living room right now or in your office, it just alters the vibe. It did alter the vibe. And from time to time, Dolly would say something and you would hear John and Yoko make a comment back. You know, it was a radio show. Uh, and they didn't take the whole thing terribly seriously. Um, I was honored to be in his presence. Uh, I, I was off that day. I remember taking a cab to the Dakota building to pick up John and Yoko and then going to the Hotel Pierre where I did the interview with Dali. His wife, Gala, was present during the interview. When I uh, went back to the hotel I was staying in, I always stayed at the Plaza Hotel in New York, I just listened to the cassette in the room, and it was miserable. It was just awful. I mean, without disparaging the way he spoke, he had a very heavy Spanish uh, accent, and his voice would fluctuate, and he would do stream of consciousness, and I would try to make it radio accessible. Um, and I wanted to know whether or not he took psychedelic drugs. And I wanted to know, uh, you know, the thinking behind the masterpieces. Of course, I'm sitting next to the creator. I was just terrible. But did you know anyone who had actually conducted a good interview with Dolly? <laughs> well, by Dolly's standards, they were all good because he was in it. <laughs> but I don't know, uh, and I've read biographies on him, etc. No, he wasn't uh, giving up too much. And among the greatest artists that I have uh, met or interviewed or represented... I've learned that the smartest thing to do is to let their art speak for themselves. That once you ask a, a Salvador Dali about a painting, well, 
it suggests to him that he's failed as a painter because he's communicated everything he has to say about the painting in the painting. It's like asking Bob Dylan what a song means. He would tell you, listen to one. So the people who try to sell their wares, promote what they do, um, they tend to fall short of what it was they initially accomplished. Kind of the way spin doctors come out after a politician makes a statement. They say, what so-and-so really meant to say was, no, forget that and let it stand. I'll get over my, uh, my Dolly failure interview. Eventually. May I just pour another glass? Of course. Do you want to tell folks what you're drinking, just to you know, be fair about this? Uh, I have a policy with the website and most things that I do that I don't promote products. I try to keep it so pristine. So I'm not going to reveal the label, but I can tell you that it is an exquisite uh, 2009 uh, Chardonnay uh, that comes from uh, Napa in Northern California. It's a very dry, light wine. And it's the kind of wine that one has in the afternoon when one's talking to Mr. Media. Uh, it's so light, it tastes like two grapes dropped in a glass of water. You couldn't have it with a meal because the food would overwhelm the wine. So in the afternoon, as the sun is setting here, um, this is just the ideal transition wine. That may be the most sophisticated alcohol anyone's ever consumed during this show. I think normally I attract a PBR type of guest, so <laughs> thank you thank you for raising the level. <laughs> Whatever gets them through the night. Exactly. Um, let's go backwards a little bit. Tell me a little bit about uh, who you are before that moment uh, at, at uh, L.A. Uh, City College. Uh, you know, uh, what did your parents do? What, what did you want to be when you grew up? I was born in the Bronx and raised in Manhattan in an area called Washington Heights. I know it well. Uh, you do? I do. I had a, my, my great aunt, who lived to be just shy of 100, uh, lived there for almost her entire adult life and was a, a legend in the neighborhood. Do you remember the street she lived on? Uh, it was 45 uh, Wad Wadsworth Terrace? Yes, I know the general area. Um, my mom and dad and my sister and I lived at uh, 190th and Fort Washington Avenue. About, for those of us, those of you who are watching who are not familiar with the neighborhood, think of an area 10 blocks above the George Washington Bridge. It was a middle class, lower middle class neighborhood. I don't know the apartment may have been. $250, $275 a month. My father was in what they called the schmata business. That's the women coats and suit business. He was an immigrant. He came here when he was 16. He worked 50 years of his life cutting the patterns and sewing them together and selling them for larger post-World War II females. Would wake up every morning at 6, go to work and 37th Street, sometimes before the air conditioning was invented, or heat. And we'd come home in the subway, and my mom, who was a housemaker, uh, would have a, a very simple meal ready for him and my sister and I. We lived in a two-room apartment. He lived, he died in that apartment at the age of 99. And um, my upbringing was fairly conventional. I was born in 1945. I was a child of the 50s in terms of my adolescence. Uh, pleasant neighborhood. I uh, had a stutter as a child. I used to t t t t talk like that. I'm not making fun of anyone, nor am I exaggerating the way I spoke. And for those of you who have a stutter, I know what it's like. And there are ways now of getting beyond it by Googling some solutions. So because of this stutter and not being able to interact with people, 
Um, I didn't talk to people. I didn't have friends. I did poorly in school. I failed at every uh, class I took. I had to take summer school classes. I wound up in a high school for five years that barely let me out with a 66 average. I wrote to uh, 50 colleges for acceptance. I was accepted by one, L.A. City College. Got on the next plane and came here. My childhood was, and I talk about it in considerably more detail on the website, my childhood was uneventful. I don't think I read a book before I was 15 or 16 years old. What I did do was I observed. Because I wasn't any good at speaking. I was really good at listening. And my granny used to say to me, the good Lord gave you two ears and one mouth, which means you should listen twice as much as you speak. I did. I watched. I listened. And uh, I didn't say anything until I was ready. I'm, I'm, I'm laughing because I, I coached uh, middle school girls soccer for, I don't know, 10, 12 years. And that's exactly what I told my kids every season. They would just yammer, you know, it's the age and they're girls and no disrespect to girls because I love them. But the, it was just the age and they would just blah, 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 blah. And I'd say, girls, it's exactly what your granny said to you. Um, and it's interesting that you said that you didn't speak until you knew exactly what you wanted to say. One of the things I, I noticed, uh, particularly I think in the video where you're interviewing John Lennon on the beach, is you're walking along and the questions are not coming from you rapid fire. It seems it seemed to me then, I didn't know about the stutter then while I watched the interview, but it seemed to me then that you were very, uh, you were listening to him carefully and you were very precise about what you asked as if every word mattered. You weren't just blathering on to him and it wasn't, uh, you don't come across as a, like a a fan type of thing you just it seemed like you were very careful about what you said so your explanation uh, you know it seems like it it that that covers a lot of ground um i had gotten over the stutter and a, and a new york accent i mean keep in mind when i got here i'd never been out of new york before i think the family went to miami for a couple of days you know but when i arrived i mean i was the kid with a New York accent and a stutter, who wanted to be on a radio and television. It was uh, certainly a challenge for my instructors. By the time that interview came along, uh, I spoke the way I do. People sometimes think I have a Canadian accent or whatever they think. It's just the result of working real hard to be able to speak at all. Before that walk on the beach in Malibu, I had known John. We had spent hundreds of hours speaking, so I felt comfortable with him. Also on the website, you can hear our first telephone call on the radio, um, and you can hear the camaraderie. More interviews will be posted with him that I did over the years. Um, but I, I employ the same technique, whether it be with a John Lennon or whether it be with somebody whose name doesn't immediately uh, resound in your head, I like to take my time. And when you slow down and when you chill, you're creating the optimum environment for your guest to feel the luxury of being able to talk with you. So, you know, I am very much anti-soundbite, which has now been reduced to a sound bark. I can't say anything in 10 seconds, including hello, nor would you want me to. I'm just allowing your answer to breathe for a moment. <laughs> With the pause, I'm just kidding. I, I, I welcome it. No, it's all right. Um, so between, uh, give me kind of the Evelyn Wood version, though, of from the time that you record this interview with the classmate at L.A. City College and then that first interview with John Lennon. Can you give us kind of, because otherwise there's, I mean, there's so much to cover. Can you give just folks kind of an overview of, of, of what, what was going on in your career? Were you, were you, were you fe doing a lot of pop culture over that time? Were you doing straight interviews, straight news? What kind of stuff was going on in that you know, seven or eight year period? At, at the risk of making uh, uh, an unceremonious plug for the website, 
I, I discussed the transition in great detail because it covers about a 10-year period, but let's see uh, how good I can be at truncating right now. I did the interview with uh, uh, Roland about JFK. I spent a few more months at L.A. City College, and um, I did a few other celebrity interviews for the local school radio show. Uh, Jane Mansfield, Jack Lemmon, uh, Richard Chamberlain. I just was the go-to guy at 19 or 20. To I spent every night writing letters to these people, hoping that they would say yes, and a few of them did. Uh, it led to my first job on a local radio station, KPFK, part of the Pacifica network of radio stations. Stayed there for a few years, interviewing the pop culture heroes of our day, who really had no other place in the early 60s to go and speak about the things that they were passionate about. Many were musicians, some were political, uh, motivated people, some were artists, dreamers, schemers, whatever they were, everybody was welcome. Um, That led to another radio station offering me a better job with more listeners and Suddenly, I wasn't being paid $75 a week, but my first commercial radio station paid me $300 a week. And let me tell you something, in 65 or 66, I was a kid who used the bus. I didn't have a car. I lived in an apartment for $90 a month, one room with a hot plate. 300 bucks a week was Valhalla. Eight or nine radio stations would follow. Eyewitness News and ABC would follow. I would just wind up being, uh, if you forgive the association, Mr. Media. I would be on KBC five nights a week doing telephone talk radio, then going to uh, ABC television to do the 11 o'clock news. Um, I interviewed everybody. And uh, it went that way until one day... I just said, I don't want to do this anymore. So I dropped out, crossed the street, and became a media consultant. That's the shortest version of 15 years of my life that I've ever That's amazing. Yeah, that's very good. All I right. A few details out, but it's probably enough that people hear that. Well, if people want to fill in the gaps, they can certainly go to ElliotMintz.com. We're certainly here to talk about that. Uh, Thank you. Yes. And we'll, we'll mention that again before we, we're done. Um, so where, uh, where do you first cross, path, cross paths with John Lennon and Yoko Ono? I mean, I'm sure you get asked that a lot, but uh, I'm going to just jump on board with that. I was on KABC Radio. It was, uh, I believe, 1971. Uh, I did a radio interview with Yoko. I was always fascinated by her. I was a little old to be a, quote, Beatle fan. Now, I love their music. Uh, As we record this, tomorrow is Ringo's 75th birthday. Um, Loved the music, but I was raised in Elvis, you know. He was my Beatles. But the John and Yoko experience hit me at the right time when they were doing their bed-ins, protesting the war in Vietnam, when they were making their political statements, when they were imagining peace. Um, I found her to be a fascinating person. I asked for an interview. She was gracious. We did it. Uh, The next day, she called me, and she said that she really enjoyed the interview. It was very, very nice speaking with me. And you've been in this uh, trade for a long time for an interview subject to call you back after the interview, to thank you. I mean, that's an endangered species if there is one. You usually do this and you never see or hear from the person again. We began a uh, telephone friendship and I would speak with her uh, you know, throughout. I'm an insomniac. I'm up at 3, 4, 5 in the morning. She wakes up very early in New York. And we spoke for days, weeks, months, every night for hours about everything. Uh, She was, she is my best friend. I've been with Yoko now for over 40 years. I've represented the estate since 1980. And uh, one day, uh, you know, I guess her husband was kind of curious as to who she would 
go off into another room and be dialing. It, it, uh, it was Jake from State Farm, wasn't it? Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, Jake from State Farm. What are you wearing? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no. Sorry. No, I'm, I'm Nothing sorry. like this at all. <laughs> they were fascinating interviews. It was a lesson in life for me. I mean, to have been coached and influenced by yoga with matters having to do with women and feminism, politics, dreaming, imagining. Optimism, Japan, art. I was transfixed by her. I installed a separate telephone in my house just for John and Yoko. It led to John doing an interview with me a few months later uh, in 1971. And uh, we got along great on the phone. Uh, And the next day, John called me. And he said, I like what we talked about, and he went into some of the details, and I said, well, look, um, you know, it's just, a, it's just a real pleasure knowing both of you. It led to me speaking with Yoko in the morning and John in the evening. The longest conversation, I think, the longest time I was ever on the phone with John and Yoko on one day was 16 hours. Yoko took the morning shift, John took the night shift. <laughs> And we had this telephone relationship that went on for months. One day they drove across the United States. John had only seen America as a beetle from a plane. Yoko had never really seen it. And they wound up in California, and I got a phone call, and it was John. He said, we're here. We're in California. We want to meet you. And I said, where are you? And he said, we're in a place called OJ. (laughs) And I later learned what he really meant to say was Ojai, which is a small community right outside, outside of Santa Barbara, but about 100 miles from L.A. You might as well have said he was in La Jolla, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I, know. I got to my car and I drove to Ojai where the two of them were. Um, they had a, a driver, a pal of theirs. They were in an old Rambler car. And they had spent... How many days it took to cross the country? They'd pull into late night coffee shops in Nevada, walk in at five in the morning, sit down at the counter and order some food. Imagine what that was like for the people who were in the coffee shop. We spent a few days uh, talking. They said that they were on their way to San Francisco and um, asked me to come along. I did. And I joined the Magical Mystery Tour. That's technically how we uh, we met. I maintained my relationship and my friendship with John until uh, the end. And uh, spoke with Yoko a couple of nights ago. I'm thinking that the uh, the reason John took to you from the beginning was that you were one of the few journalists who gave his wife respect instead of being antagonistic, attacking her, or saying one thing to her when you had her on the phone and then saying something else afterward. I mean, you treated her with respect, an abundance of respect, which was in short supply for her, I think, at that time. She was and is deserving of the respect. Um, Sadly, most of the world became aware of her and her uniqueness after the tragedy. It took that to frame her in a different light, where now she's enormously respected in her art and her work. She's a tireless keeper of the wishing well. Um, I don't know what it was about uh, me that uh, either of them found particularly appealing. I can just tell you that, you know, 90% of our conversations and visits and we traveled the world together. You know. I mean, one day a, 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 a messenger arrives with a ticket uh, for me to go to Japan with a note saying, we miss you, come see us. And I spent a, a month or two months with them in Japan. I uh, spent Christmases and New Year's and holidays and birthdays either in New York. Or they, they came to my 31st birthday in Laurel Canyon uh, just as guests to visit and to hang out. I've told these stories so many times, and I know some people get tired of it. 
some people resent the fact that I might be trading on the um, on the experience. Another group of people say, you know, I had this unique vantage point to what others consider historic or sadly messianic, and that it's my duty to share what I uh, what I experienced. I draw the line in terms of revealing secrets. I haven't written any books. I've been offered massive sums of money to do my recollections of them. Um, I honor the sanctity and the privacy of experiences shared with those I loved. I was very surprised when I looked, and I only looked peripherally, but there didn't seem to be uh, an Elliot Mintz uh, memoir uh, out there in the marketplace, and I was rather surprised. But now that you've told me that you're, and I was going to ask you about your relationship with uh, with Yoko, that it, it's continuing to this day, I can understand why that would be. Uh, let me ask you. Let me ask you this though. So, when do you transition from being the guy who wants to get that great interview with Yoko and then with John? to the guy who has this uh, close relationship that becomes, I assume at some point, it becomes a business relationship. You, you, you could not, you, you can't eat 16-hour uh, phone calls of friendship. At some point, the, the relationship evolves. For the record, I always try and establish the record, and somehow the record still gets mixed up. I never represented John and Yoko. A dollar was never exchanged between us okay. when he was alive. We were just friends. I was still uh, on the radio, on television. I was earning an income. I would get fired from every radio station I ever worked on, and during those uh, quiet periods, I would find other stuff to do, including hanging out with them. It was in 1980 when John passed. That Yoko said, look, we need somebody as a spokesperson for the estate. She couldn't handle a thousand calls a week that were coming in from media and others. Would I take the post? And I did. So uh, in that sense, I've represented the estate. John and I were just friends. And John and Yoko and I were just friends until that dark day in 1980. Where were you when you got the news? When, where were you when you heard what happened? I lived in a little community not far from where we're speaking now called Laurel Canyon. And um, I received a phone call from my mother, and uh, she just said, uh, look, I don't know what this means, but um, I just heard uh, a news bulletin uh, that there was a shooting uh, outside of the Dakota building or in midtown Manhattan. There were no other details, and I just wanted you to know. And uh, in my recollection, it was 8 or 9 o'clock in the evening. And I uh, dialed the phone number of the um, Dakota building where the doorman is, somebody who I had spoken to on numerous occasions. And I said, hi, it's Elliot, and just called to make certain everything was okay. And he hung up on me. And I knew that um, nothing was okay. Uh, I immediately packed a quick bag, booked flight 10, American Airlines, departing 10 p.m. from LAX, got into my car. It was an old car. The radio didn't work. I had no information. Got to the plane, got on the plane, boarded it. And about 15 minutes after takeoff, I saw a flight attendant emerge from the cockpit, and she was in tears. And I put my hand out, and I said, Are you okay? And she said, quote, they just killed John Lennon, close quote. That's how I learned from a woman whose name I will never know. And um, I had the next 
five hours to sit in that chair alone to do my morning and to realize that my role when that plane landed was to be of any kind of service or assist that I could be uh, to Yoko and to Sean. So whatever tears I shed would be shed there. I wasn't going to New York to and uh, landed and uh, took a cab uh, up to the Dakota building, crossed through the police lines, made my way through the thousands of people who had already gathered in front of the building, walked over the broken glass that was now a crime scene over John's spilt blood, took the elevator up, I was allowed into the apartment by the housekeeper. And I walked up to uh, Yoko's bedroom, which was locked. And I knocked on the door. She said, who's there? And I said, it's Elliot. And I'm just going to sit here on the floor. And when you're ready, just open the door. And after 15 minutes or so, she did. I embraced her. I spent the next, I don't know, six weeks, seven weeks in Manhattan dealing with uh, the things that one deals with in the wake of death, be it an anonymous death or a famous death. There were conversations to be had with uh, the police, the DA, the hospital. I received brown bag with John's clothes in it that I signed for that came back from Roosevelt Hospital that I could never open. I just wanted to be there to, uh, to comfort her and I did the best I could. That's where I was, that's how I heard about it and uh, like all of the people who are watching Mr. Media, they have their own recollections and some things never go away. I, I remember <clears throat> in the time after that happened, uh, it seemed like every, every, it seemed like every, it seemed like every epi- issue of Rolling Stone made reference to John or Yoko, there was a reference to Elliot Mintz. It seemed like you, you, you were in the media a lot, and I, you know, I was interested in media, obviously, and so, uh, that was that was part of the reason why when the opportunity to talk to you came up I thought I'd really like to I'd really like to talk to this guy because you were up close and personal at something that affected so many I mean we talked I, I a lot of people will find this offensive to compare the Kennedy assassination with what happened to John but 30 uh, 20 you know 18 it was only 18 years later actually now that I think about it, it was 81 so it's 18 years later Is my math yeah. right President Kennedy was assassinated in 1963, and John, and John was murdered in 1980. 80, okay, so it's 17 years. I mean, it's, uh, and only about a week, 17 years and a week, really. Uh, the, the, the impact that it had, considering the amount of media increase that we were dealing with, there was so much more media, news was even more instantaneous. Uh, it's just hard to imagine. And then... Obviously, your life was never the same. Uh, certainly, Yoko's, I, I, clearly, and Sean, but, I mean, your life was never the same. No. I mean, mine's a, a footnote to history. For Yoko, it was her partner. It was her other half. And I quickly interject into our conversation. There are. 24,000 homicides a year in America, 2,000 a month, 500 a week, 100 a day. They're almost always anonymous people. But each one of these deaths leave behind uh, a grieving mother, or father, or son, or daughter, brother, husband, wife. The devastation of losing uh, a child or a loved one 
at the hands of another is something that you ain't ever going to recover from. And if you do, there's a numbness about you. I don't believe in the issue of closure. I believe in the issue of forgiveness, but not pretending it never happened. Sean Ono Lennon, who I met one week after he was born, John and Yoko called and said, look, come to New York. We want you to see our son. Um, and their little Sean was. He was at my house, uh, I don't know, a month or two ago. And uh, I have known him from the week he was born until now. Uh, as we record this in uh, July of 2015, in Three months, Sean will turn 40. Think of that. Yeah, that's crazy. That's uh, crazy. It, it, the fact is, he was five years old when his father was murdered. And among all the other unspeakable things about the loss is the reality that that wonderful, beautiful boy only got to spend five years with his dad. That's, that pushes the unforgivable button pretty closely, doesn't it? Oh, He's a great kid. And, and on the website, uh, there's an hour and a half uh, video conversation of Sean and I uh, sitting in this room talking, not about this subject, but other subjects uh, that I think people would find fascinating. How was he doing? You know, I, I was just, I'm trying to think. I actually heard him, I think he did like an, he may have done like an hour interview with Howard Stern in the last couple of years. He showed up and uh, he did an interview. It was fascinating to, to, to hear them talk. Am, am I right about that? Or am I imagining that? Um, Julian. I believe, did the lengthy interview with Howard Stern, and I believe that Sean did a phoner. Is that what it was? Okay. In, in the middle of the night with Howard. Um, Howard is not a big fan of Yoko's. Right. But um, Sean is very protective of his mother. They have a marvelous, wonderful, loving relationship. Sean is Yoko's music director in her recordings and her live performances. I've seen them on stage many times. He has his own group called Ghost of a Sabertooth Tiger, featuring him and his uh, his girlfriend of many years, uh, Charlotte Kemp Mule. And um, he's one of the wisest beings that I know. Uh, the apple does not fall far from the tree. And uh, he's the brother that I never had. I once, you know, John once said to me, look, we were thinking about having you as the godfather, but we decided it should be Elton because he was going to give Sean better Christmas presents. <laughs> and that's in typical and in satirical, partially caustic expression. So, and Sir Elton, of course, uh, does a, a marvelous job with Sean, but I'm the uh, secondary, unspoken, unofficial godfather. That's not bad. That's not bad. So uh, I'm going to change gears a little bit because I, I well, I, I see we've been we've been at it for a while, and uh, a couple other things I wanted to touch on with you. Am I getting boring now? Oh God, no, 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 no. I think we could go on for quite a while. Yes. Uh, but um, two two things I want to touch on with you. First of all, I'm wondering. Who you enjoy as an interviewer, uh, as someone who's done so many interviews, and it could be generational. It doesn't have to be today. You know, I, I wondered, you know, how you felt about someone like a Larry King or Barbara Walters, or or if there's other people who've stood out to you. And then, uh, and then I have a, a, another question about that. Uh, my two favorites uh, are Christian Ampour, who I think is. Um, one of the best interviewers, best journalists that I have ever seen. And for those of you who are not immediately familiar with her, 
You can see her on CNN and 60 Minutes. She does features for both of them. Uh, brilliant in terms of international, solid, direct news coverage. I've always been enamored by Charlie Rose, who is a superb listener, who does penetrating interviews, and who does not try to upstage his guests. Those are the two reigning ones. I also recently did a Facebook post uh, because yesterday was Geraldo Rivera's birthday. And um, I wanted people to know that beyond all the recollections they have of Geraldo as the tabloid television guy, he has emerged into an incredibly sober, meaningful, committed, passionate uh, journalist. And I like him very much. Uh, Larry King is a friend of mine. Um, he's no longer doing network television. He's doing a podcast now of his own with his wife. He's and, and television as well. Um, look, Larry's interviewed everybody that breathes. And his work with uh, Marlon Brando, Frank Sinatra, you know, ranks among the biggest. I like Morley Safer. And then, and of course, I like you. And then, then the list runs very thin. Just in the past week or two or three, I've been doing a couple of interviews to promote the website, which is free, by the way. So that, that I'm not doing this for, for cash. I'm doing this to share stuff with people. Uh, and among some of the interviews that I've done and some of the people who have interviewed me, I was a little disappointed in their, their abilities. Because of the Internet and a thousand different podcasts and blogs and the rest of it, everybody thinks they can be a great paparazzi if they've got a camera. And everybody thinks that they could be a great interviewer if they have a microphone. It, it really is an art form and practiced by very few. Any, and this is where I want to kind of wrap up, actually. I wondered if uh, you had any really good tips. Just, just tell me. Don't let these other people know. But, I mean, you know, what, if you were teaching a, a master class, and I suspect you could, what would you want people to know about making a good conversation, making it work, and, and keeping the interest of that person sitting across from you? Fine question. Um, and the answer uh, goes beyond the interview experience, electronic journalism, print journalism, but it goes into having a conversation with a friend of yours who comes over to the house, or if you're on a date, or whoever you're talking to. Try your best during the course of the conversation not to begin sentences with the words I, me, my, or mine. Sounds like a George Harrison song. But basically, the conversation is not all about you. When you're speaking, you're never learning. So if you're with somebody like this, or in a social situation, Learn about them. Ask about their lives, their experiences, their feelings. We use this expression called catching up. We should get together, Elliot, um, have dinner and just catch up. We haven't spoken to each other in 15 years. Catch up to what? What am I going to tell you about my life in 15 years? What are you going to share with me about yours? Um, over the course of a two-hour meal. So the first is to listen. The second is to make it less about your personal resume and a greater inquiry into theirs. Another is to be non-judgmental. You asked a question, 
somebody gave you an answer, you didn't like the answer, you disagreed. So what? That's your trip. You asked. Allow them to express themselves. It allows you to learn more about them. And finally, for our purposes, um, don't do it. Don't engage in conversation with people unless you really want to, unless you really have a passion for who they are, what they are, how they feel. Life is very short. You know, for most, uh, I'm 70 years old now. I don't measure my life in decades anymore. I measure them more in months. I don't waste time on frivolous, uh, you know, dinner dates and occasional meetings. I just want to be with people where we can reach a space in each other's heart where we can say hello. Very nice. Very nicely put. And by the way, I need to point out, clearly we were going to be talking about John Lennon, but uh, I have to mention that Elliot did manage to squeeze in uh, Ringo Starr's name. We know that he, had, he was turning 75. There was a reference just a moment ago to George Harrison because something sounded like a Harrison song. The fourth Beatle has gone unnamed in this entire conversation. I just want to point that out. Somehow we got three of four in. <laughs> uh, only because my time with uh, Paul McCartney was extremely limited. Um, I once contributed a chapter to a book called Memories published by Harper and Collins, edited by Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis. Um, the chap, it was just an idea of taking 12 or 15 or 20 people who knew John, each of them would write a paragraph or a chapter about their experiences with him. I wrote one. It's the only thing I've ever written about John. It's on my website. It's on YouTube, Memories, John Lennon. And I spoke about uh, Christmas that I spent with uh, John and Yoko and Paul and Linda. Um, and it was a Christmas where we met at the Dakota. Uh, we hung out. We traveled uptown to a restaurant called Elaine's. Uh, we had a meal there. Then we came back to the Dakota, sat and talked. Uh, gave me a great insight and opportunity to meet uh, uh, and really get a grasp of the, the vibe between Paul and John. I have met him on a variety of, uh, of other occasions. As recently as four months ago, I was having dinner at a local place that he likes, and he came in with his new bride, and he couldn't have been more friendly and delightful. Um, in a separate interview, I'll tell you that uh, a couple of years ago, I took Donald Trump to see Paul's concert at the Hard Rock Cafe in Las Vegas. Um, I don't speak about Paul only because I don't know him that well. But on every occasion that we've met, uh, he could not have been uh, uh, more kind and uh, friendly to me. He and Yoko have uh, established a marvelous uh, working relationship and all the wounds have been healed, you know? So I, wanna, I didn't mean to suggest anything negative by the fact that he hadn't been mentioned. I just wanted to show I was paying attention. And you were. <laughs> and I was in grandstand. No, no, not at all. That was wonderful. And, and listen, it, we, we got a little insight there on uh, the, uh, Paul and... It was wonderful. Um, all right, listen, folks, uh, you can and should visit Elliot Mintz's online TV and radio interview archive. It's at ElliotMintz.com. It's E-L-L-I-O-T-M-I-N-T-Z.com. It is uh, full of amazing interviews with amazing people. There's just no other way to, to refer to these folks. Uh, you, you, it's one of those things where you will get a little insight into them. You'll hear them in a different way than maybe you're used to. And uh, each of the interviews captures a moment in time. Uh, frankly, I'm always surprised that more people who do what Elliot has done and what I guess what I'm doing now haven't shared these interviews from another era because this stuff is fascinating. You, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's part of our heritage. It's, uh, 
it's great cultural stuff, and it's just fun to get lost in there for a couple hours. So I, I seriously encourage folks uh, watching or listening to this to do that. Elliot, are you, uh, are you involved in any social media? People find you on Twitter, Facebook, any of that kind of stuff? I don't tweet because it, you know, it takes me so long to say anything that I can't do it in <laughs> a few letters. But I do have a Facebook page. I'm told that, that I have my 5,000 friends and I can't have any more friends. Uh, but uh, you could just go on Facebook and type in my name. There are two or three other accounts that I have, one having to do just with the website. And I do my occasional uh, postings, etc. You have been uh, so kind, such a, a marvelous uh, listener. And um, what you have said about me and the opportunity that you have given to me uh, does not uh, go by without enormous affection and appreciation. I thank you, sir. Oh, my pleasure. And, 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 and thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Media, today. My pleasure. Good for as long as you want to go. I'm not sleepy and there is no place I'm going to. <laughs> very I, nice. Very and nice. I never use four-letter language. Ah. Ever. Even uh, my closest friends of 30 years will tell you that they've never heard me use a so-called obscene word. I view that as um, a form of verbal violence, that you can be uh, aggressive towards people, violent towards people in many, many ways, and sometimes it's a baseball bat, and sometimes it's with verbiage. Uh, George Carlin taught me the words. Okay. I just elected not to repeat them. Very good. Uh, I lift my glass to you. Hi, this is Buzz Burbank in the Buzz Burbank Newsroom, preparing for you another Buzz Burbank News and Comment. Do you like good stories? Boy, I sure do. I turn over a lot of stones each day to make sure I don't miss the best ones. Sure, some make me angry, and some make me sad, and some make me laugh, and isn't that what makes us human? I'm proud of the fact that I pack more news into my 10 or 15 minutes a day than the evening news does in a half hour. It's a free podcast at buzzburbank.com, or you can subscribe free at iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or get it on any RSS device. It's like a newspaper for your head. It's Buzz Burbank News and Comment, another Realm Network presentation. Weekday mornings right here on the Realm Network. Ladies and gentlemen, children of all ages, welcome to the George and Tony Entertainment Show. Prepare for awesome mediocrity. We're the Cousin Oliver of the Realm Network. I'm George. And I'm Tony. And we're a weekly family-friendly podcast about pop culture. From our point of view. At RealmNetwork.com. The George and Tony Entertainment Show. From the Realm Network. This is Snake. Do you read me, Otacon? Loud and clear, Snake. Did you listen to the latest episode of the Gaming Marathon on the Realm Network? Of course. They really know their stuff about gaming, especially that Usid guy. Yeah, but that Chirac guy is a real jerk. I don't like him. Regardless, the reviews are spot on and they tell it like it is. That's for sure. What, what happened, Snake? Were you spotted? Nah, it's just Lil Melser crying about the O's again. Uh, whew, close call. I better continue the search for Metal Gear, but keep listening to the Gaming Marathon each week. You got it, Snake. New every Monday afternoon right here on the Realm Network. 
It's the Mark and Lowell Show. Hi, this is Mark. And this is Lowell. And if you're fans of Don and Mike, you may know who we are. Our number one interns. You, you've met them on the show. They're the guys that ate all the junk, and they were outside with each other holding hands with a sign that said that they loved each other wearing the dunce caps. And what you may not know is that we started out as fans back in their WABA days. Hi, Don and Mike. It's Mark and Lowell. Oh, yeah. These are, these are two guys that uh, we once actually called them our protégés, didn't we? And now we have our own show, so we want you to give it a shot. And just check us out at the Realm Network, realmnetwork.com, or you can go to markandlowell.com. Resistance is futile. It's the Mark and Lowell Show. Every Tuesday and Thursday evenings right here on the Realm Network. And catch the Poor Premium Show Friday nights.